Uh, so I'm, I'm told that our speaker is uh, getting ready for this uh, for today's presentation. This is our last of the um, of the semester, and I am very pleased to welcome Olivier Charbonneau, who's a doctoral student here at the University of Montreal. He's also an associate librarian librarian at Concordia University. Uh, he's primarily interested in copyright issues, as well as questions of open access and social media, Web 2.0. He's a doctoral student, I just mentioned that, over 15 years of professional involvement in library and cultural communities. Holds two master's degrees from the University of Montreal, one in information sciences and one in law, uh, as well as an undergrad degree in commerce from McGill. Uh, he has kept a research blog since 2005. That's quite an achievement mm -hmm. in French. At uh, 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 oh well, that <laughs> everything is there. Okay. Um, what else? A, a work blog since two, 2011 in English at outfine.ca. So on top of that, working very hard. Uh, on his doctoral dissertation, <laughs> and today, uh, copyright à contrario, droit d'auteur à contrario. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. So thank you for having me. Um, I am taping this session, and hopefully I'll be able to release uh, the file on my YouTube channel shortly after today, so probably in the next week or so. Uh, and I'm doing a Can Canadian presentation whereby my slides are in French, but I'm going to be speaking in English. So the worst thing that could happen is you actually discover that you can read French. So I'm going to get started. Um, um, here I have a, uh, everything that I produce, I post online, so all the documents and all of the research that I've created is actually available on the free web, specifically on Spectrum, the uh, institutional depository of, repository of uh, Concordia University, so if you uh, type Spectrum Olivier Charbonneau, you get to this page where you can download all the peer review articles and presentations that I'm going to give. This talk, the PowerPoint, will not be there because it actually contains things that I'm going to include in my PhD dissertation, so I'm not going to put it online right yet. Sounds good? So far so good? Okay. So I hope this is clear. This is a warning, right? So, okay. Questions? About, this is very, very, very important. No, okay. It's just to say that I'm not a lawyer. Je ne suis pas un avocat. So this is not legal advice. This presentation presents theories my theories, whether or not they're true is a whole other issue. And epistemolo epistemologically speaking, I include licenses in copyright. So I have a pluralist conception of copyright. So it's not just positivist, hard law. It actually includes what people do with the law. Uh, and we could talk about that in a second. So just to give some context, I have here a quote from the Columbia, Columbia Law Review from 1945, and I love looking at the history of copyright because you actually notice that everything repeats itself in how copyright is brought out. But let me read this because it'll put some context. So, copyright is the Cinderella of the law. Her rich older sisters, franchises, and patents long crowded her in the, corne uh, in the chimney corner. Suddenly, the fairy godmother mother, invention endowed her with me mechanical and electrical devices as magical as the pumpkin coach and the mice footman. Now she whirls through the mad mazes of a glorious ball. Now, this was in 1945 by a, a Zacharias Chaffee, who actually wrote a series of ar articles on how copyright is transformed with technologies. But it, this is this is still this is still accurate today, right? And we're actually, uh, if you if you look research copyright from the past, anytime there's a new way to produce music, make it available, radio, you always had copyright issues arise. Anyways, so that's just to put some context about about copyright. Now, I have three things I want to do with you today. I want to distinguish access and reproduction, which is one of the main emergent themes in Bill C-11, the copyright reform. Uh, people are still stuck analyzing copyright as a reproduction right. And one of the very interesting things that Bill C-11 introduced in the Copyright Act on November 7th, when it came into force last year, was the concept of making available or the making accessible on the free internet. And people don't quite understand what that implies. They don't quite get where the economics of that go. And that's where I'm actually centralizing my, my interest, my research interest. So we'll talk about that. Then I want to put libraries and see, this is going to be a library presentation. Ha! <laughs> Suckers! No, um, I am a librarian and one of the best questions, the big questions we have is how to use, how, how do digital markets of culture emerge and where, what is the role of libraries within that context? And the idea here is that, you know, if you get a sponsor to pay for the creation of a work, then you can make it available online for free and that happens in different kinds of scenarios. So, 
How much would it cost to get all of the books published by all of Quebec authors? How much would that cost? How much would the copyright cost so that they're available for free on the free web? Give me a price, anybody, right? That's the kind of question librarians are working on right now to figure out where do they fit in. And so if that happens, what happens to bookstores? What happens to publishers? What happens to the whole production ecosystem around that? That's the burning question in the universe. And if you're in a, in a jurisdiction like Quebec that has provincial laws that regulate culture, when I don't know if I'll have to get time to get into those. That's the context. How do you reform those? How do you work through those to have a mark to have uh, flourishing markets of culture? That's point two. <laughs> At point three is I'm going to I'm going to explore fair dealings, which are exceptions to copyright, and I'm going to make wild claims about them that are not out there right now. They're not being discussed, but those are my wild mm -hmm. claims about that. And hopefully, will be able to engage in conversation. And uh, um, I don't know if I'll be able to keep to uh, one hour may, may go a little bit over, but hopefully it'll 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 go smoothly. Okay, so I'm going to go really quickly with the first point. Okay, um, actually no, that was the plan. It doesn't matter. So what happened? Things changed. The internet emerged. You now have everybody in this room. I'm sure has a phone that is pretty close to what a TV studio and a radio radio studio needs to be. So you are actually walking media empires right now. Did you know that? You have in your pocket, this prints you money. This creates copyrights for you. And that means money, right? So that's what Web 2.0 is all about. So that's, uh, that's, that's the change, the paradigm shift that we saw emerge in the last uh, couple of decades, which people talk about, and I'm going to skip because you guys all get that. Now, what that brings forward is three phenomena that I want to uh, talk about the consequences of those. So the first one is it introduces the user in the copyright chain. Okay, the copyright markets. Before it was, copyright was an industrial law. It involved creators and the industry, right? So you signed a contract with a publisher, the publisher made your book available. The fact that people bought it was secondary in the act. They may make some photocopies, but that was secondary. You had some licensing you could deal with collecting societies. But that wasn't really important in the market. But the introduction of the user is really important. And so Copyright becomes this tango à trois, this dance of three, where you have the creator, the industry, and the user trying to figure out their role. And you see that in Bill C-11 and, and the way that the Copyright Act was modified with things like the user-generated content exception and the different exceptions that we had before but that were, that were strengthened, strengthened in this, different ways. The second phenomenon is the original is the same as the copy. There's no more distinction. There's no more signal degradation. It's a, a perfect, a digital copy of something that's born digital is by definition a perfect copy. It gets a little weird if you have a six meg a gigabyte file and you try to make, I mean, you do have some, some computer capacity problems with copying super huge files, but in and of itself, you can go on Vimeo right now and download movies for free because pe people have posted them out there. And for all intents and purposes, the high definition version is the same as the original that was posted up there. So we have the death of the copy, and that's alluding to my uh, quest to understand uh, reproduction rights, and also the emergence of non-exclusive terms in licensing. Okay, things like Creative Commons, where you don't have to give exclusive uh, rights to something for a commercial exploitation to happen. If you post a video on YouTube, you give Google and YouTube non-exclusive rights to use your documentation. That's a huge difference in what it used to be when labels are looking for 360-degree uh, contracts to have all of the rights they can. So that's what you had in the that's the previous model, and the current model that's emerging is uh, non-exclusivity -exc in copyright market. So that's also very interesting to to notice as a consequence of the of this paradigm shift. Last thing is contracts are more important than the law. When you're using a digital work, what were the terms of use of the site that you got it from? That is actually more important than reading the Copyright Act because sometimes these contracts say that you know you can't have access to your fair dealing rights anymore. They're gone. Uh, so, and this is really important for librarians because before we would just buy books and subscribe to journals, and there were there weren't any terms of use really. But now, a uh, university like the University of Montreal that spends what is it 18 million? I forget the exact figure. 12 million? I, I know for Concordia we spend five million dollars on stuff, but we don't have law or medicine or architecture. Those expensive faculties we don't have, but you guys have them. And for us, three quarters of what we buy is digital material. 
So that represents a huge market worldwide, like multi-billion dollar market where it's all under contract and you have to read the terms of use of that documentation to be able to research and be effective in different kinds of ways. So for example, another example is uh, anybody here subscribes to, uh, you know, whatever streaming uh, services, Netflix or whatever out there, you have to read the terms. Can you record a Netflix film and post it on YouTube? Well, read the term of the contract. Copyright says you can under the user-generated exception, uh, but what about the Netflix contract? What does it say? And is, does that take over copyright? Awesome questions. Plenty of fun to write a doctoral dissertation. Uh, and so what I, I'm trying to get at is that distinction between publication and re reproduction, which were the classic uh, Article 3 uh, uh, concepts used to make uh, markets emerge from copyright into the mise à disposition or making available and access rights, which were introduced with Bill C-11. And there's a huge distinction in when you start looking at the economics behind, uh, the digital economics behind uh, cultural works, and we'll get into that in a second. Okay, sounds good? So I, I'm just kind of introducing everybody to where I'm at in terms of uh, what's happening in, in culture, in, in cultural markets, and how that's impacting the way that we traditionally think about markets. Okay? So let's talk about theorems, because I have to talk about theorems. This, there's no other way. And I'm going to posit three theorems. And I, of course, have to have swanky names, right? Because I am a, you know, a digital native. Uh, I'm 35 years old. And I, I actually learned how to type on a computer before I learned how to write. We had a TSR-80 at home from Radio Shack. And my brother was in, in grade one, and I was in kindergarten. So I, he, could, he could recognize the letters. And we, it came with this big book. And we re realized that if we reproduced the letters on the keyboard, the screen would do funky things like blink, right? So blink, B-L-I-N-K, five, it would blink five times. And we'd spend hours looking for the right characters on the keyboard. It's not that important. First one is the uh, quantum paradox in economics. This is, uh, this is to say that digitally, digital, digital culture behave in two distinct ways. The default economic uh, value of a digital work is a public good. And I'm not talking about the sociological public good. I'm talking about the economic public good, whereby you, you, it's non-exclusive and non-rival. So you can't, it's hard to forbid somebody from making a copy, and once a copy is made, the original isn't degraded. So it's not like eating an apple. If I eat the apple, I can't sell you an apple because I've eaten my apple, but if I have an MP3 file, I can give you a copy of my MP3 file. It's really hard for, you know, for the labels to stop me doing that, especially if I'm a Swedish teenager, they can't stop them, right? Uh, and my original digital file isn't depleted. Um, other examples of public good uh, uh, economics in, uh, in digital culture is the Streisand effect. I don't know if you know about the Streisand effect, but Barbara Streisand tried to stop a researcher from publishing aerial photographs of the, Easter, of the western seaboard, and her mansion was taken in these aerial photographs. And the researcher was studying, I don't know, marine biology of some kind, and she wanted to see soil degradation, and she just happened to like fly over the whole of the big part of the western seaboard, including Barbara Streisand's mansion. And so she didn't want to have her mention on, she tried to stop this, this, this researcher from public. And of course, the story got out, and it went viral. And a lot, a lot more people watched that picture of her, of her house than would have normally if it had just been this random. So this is what we call a network effect. It's a positive network effect where the more people view something, the more it's worth, the more it engage, engages people. It's the going viral thing. It's the same idea in the book publishing world. If you publish a best, bestseller, more people talk about it. And so more, more people want to read it. And it creates this positive feedback loop where more and more people engage with your, with your digital, with your cultural good. So that's the public good side of the equation. And of course, what copyright does is that it creates a private good. So from the idea that you can copy this MP3 file and do whatever you want with it and you still have your original MP3 file, something has to forbid you from doing that if you want to have market characteristics emerge from these privately produced public goods, right? And so that's what copyright does. Because it forbids you from doing certain things, i.e. engaging in the public good side of your work, then you have a market that can emerge because you have a private good, it is excludable, and so on and so forth. So this tension whereby the digital nature of the work is a public good by its economic characteristics, but copyright brings it back into a private good, creates a really interesting 
quantum paradox because both characteristics exist at the same time. Now the, the astute rights holder will use this tension to make money off the popularity of their work. So in the digital culture, maybe you want to give a sample away. Maybe when you, you want to release your music under Creative Commons and sell more tickets to your show. Maybe there's a way to engage in this network effect to the benefit of the right holder. But the classic all rights reserved may not be the best economic option to bring out digital culture. And by the way, if you look at the analog world, you know, the, the, the old world, the paper world, books and libraries were the public good side of publishing, and the bookstore was the private good side of publishing. Okay, so what we're looking for is to how to transpose that model into the digital world, keeping in mind the economic par par paradigms involved with the cultural works, right? Everybody's looking at me really intently, which either means that you're reviewing what you need to buy for dinner tonight, or you're engaged in what I'm saying. And I'm going to assume it's the latter. Okay, so <laughs> all right, I got, I got, I got into the whole analysis of getting into. I don't have time to really dissect these uh, concepts. Of course, you will be able to download a copy of my thesis in the next 18 months if all goes well. Knock on wood, it should be approved and published and available or buy it, I suppose. Uh, and I talked about uh, the differences between examples of private goods and public goods and how they were fostered in different times by, by the government. So I'm not going to get into all of that, but it's there. Okay, so that's my first, it's the quantum paradox that given a digital cultural file, it has both characteristics of a private good and a public good, and you can use that dialectic tension to make tons of cash, i.e. Facebook or Google, or, you know, uh, Metallica doesn't want people to share when well, that's their right, right? And what the, what does that mean for their economics? Anyways, those are awesome questions that I'm just not gonna get into right now. Now, the another uh, another pa uh, uh, theorem that I want to present is the con consent continuum. The idea that you have if you plot on an axis based on the amount of risk, okay, you have different options to use a work. Okay, the least of somebody else's work, right? The least risk possible is when you have a, a, a contract and you transfer the rights to yourself, a cession de droit. That's the least risk because you're dealing with the original right holder. You have a contract. You you have consent. That's like the least least risk. Well, presumably the least risk. And so a little bit more risk is a license, for example. Uh, you know, if you want a non-exclusive use or just a use right. Um, because you may do things with the work that you're not, not supposed to as per the license, there's a little bit more risk. And of course, these are not to scale the X's, it's just indicative, right? So it could be closer or narrower. Uh, then you have limitations, so uh, collecting societies. Again, you could do things that are not part of your, uh, uh, your, your, your use, right? And if, uh, also Creative Commons licensing. Uh, if you if you use Creative Commons works, some of the Creative Commons and other types of open licensing aren't super clear. For example, what is non-commercial? There was a study made of uh, people who use Creative Commons licensing that 68% of those who publish under or make works available under Creative Commons uh, think that using works in a school is commercial. And so they would equate non-commercial -com school use or educational use as two commercial uses, which is not. Anyways, that's kind of a weird one, but anyways. And then you have uh, fair use, fair dealings, and other exceptions, which is a lot more risk than obtaining a license, but still allows you to use, right? And then the final fun one is violation, because you could just ignore copyright and still use. Now, that's the most risky situation. And so the idea with this continuum is that all of these options are open to you. Right? When you want to use a work, you can infringe, or you can get a contract, or you can claim fair dealing. And depending on how, you're, how you perceive risk, you may want to use one or the other. And plotting it this way also helps people understand uh, that this continuum exists across the world and independently of what the laws say. The only thing that laws and court cases do is they make two, two options closer or further from each other. So for example, if the Supreme Court in 2004 in CCH decision would have said, no, 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 libraries cannot send faxes to lawyers, that's not fair dealing, well then the fair dealing would have gone way down closer to the violation because there wouldn't have been a lot of wiggle room between a violation and, and fair dealings. Anyways. So this is the other, I mean the kind of subtext of what I'm trying to do here is also explain to the universe what is copyright and how it works and that having things like this helps them understand. 
So, so that's the consent continuum, and it's important to keep in mind because that's a theorem that's important to, in, to understand using copyrighted works. Power asymmetries, uh, and this is where I get into uh, fun uh, uh, postmodernism in law and, and looking at power issues and power asymmetries and markets, and the fact that copyright is a monopoly power creates a huge power asymmetry. And this is the, this is the classic supply chain, right, from the creator who thinks... Right, I, I, I suck at drawing, so this is my PowerPoint skills. Right, getting the text to go that way was like I was like really proud of that. <laughs> and so you have here your supply chain, and you have the final consumer in the end. And this is kind of in theory what it looks like for most things. And I've I've uh, if you summarize it to the creator, the copyright industry, and then the users, the idea here is that you could plot what kind of power asymmetries emerge, and there are different institutions within markets and within the law to foster, uh, uh, to foster a more e equilibrium re uh, relationship. So for example, for the creator, they own the original copyright, there's a high consent form in obtaining copyright from them. It has to be in writing to, op to operate a transfer. Uh, you also have funding programs to fund original creation so that you know they don't have to always go to the industry to create. Uh, so those are institutions that exist to correct the balance within economic markets in favor of creators. Same idea for the copyright industries. So you have uh, funding programs, you have Article 3 in the Copyright Act, which tells you what they what they can do with the Act. It gives them the roadmap to what they can do. Uh, formalities also help them. And they, of, of course, uh, infractions to copyright uh, um, are controlled by penal and civil law. So those are, are mechanisms that exist to correct uh, asymmetries within the copyright markets to the benefit of the industry. And then, of course, creators are, well, we have limitations and exceptions. We, us, right? And then we can use libraries, we can use books for free, you can learn for free by going to libraries and going to universities and things like that. So the idea is that these, uh, these theorems are present and they need to be transposed to the digital world as well. And that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so far so good. So let's take a moment of zen, right? Because I think we need to... <laughs> Any questions so far? Because I've just went through about 100 pages of my thesis in the last 15 minutes. So far, so good? Question, yeah? La symmetrie de pouvoir vient du, euh, du, du fait que la loi octroie les pouvoirs à ceux qui font la création. C'est de ça d'origine? Je pense que c'est plus fondamental que ça. So the question is, do, the, do power symmetries emerge from the fact that creators get the original copyright? I don't think that's quite the case. I, don't th I think the power symmetries existed when there was no copyright. The idea that you have to, an author has to write a whole novel because they could, before they could sell their first copy has nothing to do with copyright. It's just the nature of the economic good that is a novel. Right. So when you want to eat when you're writing a novel, you either get a day job or you get a you know a grant from the Canada Council or you know your publisher gives you an advance on the royalties. In which case you're like you must write this novel. The, that's the that's the parameters. That's the economic parameters that surround the cultural good. And copyright is one of the different institutions that fits into understanding how these markets work. Right. Is that? I wouldn't say copyright uh, uh, dictates. The power symmetries, but it's it's within the basket of, of issues that we have to look at. I'm a very pluralist guy. I will never claim that the law does anything. Oh. Society does the law. That's usually my my angle. But you understand what I'm saying, right? Uh, no problem. But just uh, I wow, find, find the, the, the place that where you find the, the asymmetry. Why? Because it's very simple. Um, if it's a capital issue. I'm the author. I have. I just spent two years writing a, a book, right? I want to publish it, and I have to find a publisher who's willing to invest in my book. The intellectual property is worth something, but it's not worth anything until I have a contract with a publisher. Who has the power? There you go. It's the power of symmetry because you can have the best novel in the universe. It's not worth squat until you start selling copies, and that's why publishers are afraid of the Lulu, uh, you know, uh, all these self-publishing initiatives because exactly they lose their power. Then the power of symmetry goes away. But it's a classic. I mean, I don't want to go down the Marxist route, but you could totally do that in this in this kind of analysis, right? But what about uh, what uh, the the authors used to do in the nineteenth century? 
of publishing parts of their novels along the way in newspapers uh, uh, and, yeah. and getting paid for that. So you yeah. had market-based solutions Absolutely. that power uh, that editors could have at the time. Exactly. So, so it's, yeah. it's not that clear cut. Yeah. yeah. But I would say I would say that's that would be a way to create another asset, which is the uh, la notoriété. Your, your reputation. Yeah, exactly. You, and that you still get paid. You're, you're writing your first chapter. You're paid for your first chapter, mm. and then you get an incentive to finish your novel. Right. At the same so time. so that's and, an interesting. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, an. So I, that's not yeah. that clear cut for me. This this uh, they, they, there's a monopoly, but it's. There's ways around the monopoly. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh no, yeah, and I, I'm completely. But I mean, it's hard to, to explain the in, ins and outs of this in. No, of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah fair and enough. the asymmetry will uh, happen only if they are just one publisher that is involved in. in of course, the of course. And it's not the case. It's Normally, not the case. You have open market, yeah. and if somebody uh, try to. You know, I've talked to a lot of, 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 of authors who wanted to get published and were never able to get yeah. anybody interested. It's and so, problem. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if, if just one publisher uh, knows that he has that power, it is a material. Yeah, exactly. Or if you want to publish with that, pub you know, some people are yeah. like, I want to be, you know. So, but the, I mean, this is just, I'm just, it's like a car the cartoon version of my <laughs> uh, <laughs> epic, epic. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for that, though. That's uh, that's what moments Zen moments are for. This is uh, off the uh, Maiga Archipelago in the Saint Laurent. I I took this picture. This is my copyright. Okay, just to be clear that I'm not infringing on anybody's. Uh... Okay, so I really love bibliothéconomie in French. As a, this is librarianship in French because it's the economics of books. It's the economics of knowledge, and I'm so shocked and, and saddened that the École de Bibliothèque Économie et de Sciences de l'Information isn't just using that word, because it's very elegant. And so what I'm trying to figure out, I'm calling it l'analyse bibliothèque économique du droit d'auteur. So that's my kind of claim to fame. <laughs> huh? Pardon? Uh, because I teach law and economics, so uh, it's just a joke. Uh, so I, 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 went, I want to become a bibliothèque économiste. That's what I want to be when I grow up, someday. So... <laughs> 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 Maybe I'm grown up already. I guess if you have a mortgage, you're probably grown up by now. Uh, so a library. Uh, a library, one of the few places that is defined is, is in Article 2 in the Copyright Act, where you actually get a broad definition of what a library is. And that's really interesting. I mean, you have special laws for Library and Archives Canada, for Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec, and all these kinds of specific state institutions that tell you the mandate and composition of the board and all that stuff. But if you want a broad definition of what a library is, Article 2 of the Copyright Act. And of course, they also lump in museums and archives, but let's not go there right now. I don't have time to get into that. Because um, you have to distinguish them, and they all do all sorts of crazy things with stuff, and let's not go there. Um, Essentially, museum archives and libraries, or LAMs, Library Archives Museum, LAMs, as we're called in the act, we are the original long tail of Anderson's model, you know, of the long tail, right? When he plotted what Amazon would do in the future, which would be selling a few copies of many, many, many different things, uh, the bookstore would have your front list and would have your bestsellers and a few other nice titles to sprinkle around their collection. But anything that was older than three to six months, because that's the half-life of a book, you would go get from a library. So if you wanted something that was published five years ago, you unless it was the super well-known bestseller, you wouldn't go to the bookstore. So that model, that's the model from the print world. So preservation and access is the other thing. So the question here, which was the, and I'm using the word libraries, not in the library of Alexandria sense of 2,000, 3,000 years ago, more in the uh, founding fathers of the United States in the Victorian era of the public, free public library, with that, that specific take on libraries, is that you, you, you have to be able to learn after you've depleted your budget. So if, I ha if I'm a, 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 a household, if you look at the household expenditure on books, do you know how much is the average household expenditure on books according to Statistics Canada? It's $42 a year, okay? So what happens, uh, give or take a couple dollars, right? So what happens is you have a lot of people who buy no books, right? And then you have a few people who buy lots and lots and lots of books, right? And I'm a big reader. I go to the public library all the time. I borrow uh, bande dessinée because they're too expensive for me to buy. And I read like 20 a week or I don't know, 10 a week. 
I shouldn't be saying this in, in front of a professor. I am writing my thesis also in, in between tete and mangas and stuff. Uh, but the idea here is that you have to have a mechanism in society where you can learn after. And why is that? Why should you have that? Actually, that, that's a very important question to a librarian because it's about innovation. If you can only innovate to the capacity that you have a budget for, and there's no way to share the cost or have a, a public good or, or, or a club good that allows you to innovate and learn and grow, then your society may stumble. And that's, that's one of the big problems, right? So that's part of uh, the economic definition of a library. And of course, we have to be nonprofit, and we have, there are specific regulations that can happen. But the idea here is that we combat two things in society. We combat forgetting and ignorance. And those two things could be the negative externality that happened from economic markets of culture, knowledge, and information. If you have to rely solely on econ economic markets to have information, culture, and, and, and knowledge transmitted in society, if you have market failures, if you have transaction costs, if you have any problems with that market, thus, that's your pollution. And we combat cultural pollution. So anyways, that's my... And, you know, it's, it's really funny. Nobody's really defined the library in economic terms. I'm trying to do it, right? I don't know if I'm doing a good job at it, but there is an absence of document. A lot of people talk about budgets and libraries and how much libraries cost, but nobody's really able to measure what is the economic impact of a library, of a public library, of a school library, of a university. How much money does it take? Is it, is it, does it foster? I don't know. It's, it, and there's a few like UNESCO type organizations and the OECD that are trying to devise protocols to, and then some people are not quite tackling these issues directly. But so the question would be, how, what is the optimum amount of money a municipality in Quebec should invest in their public library, right? What is the optimum amount of money a school board should invest in there? University, government agency, corporation. You have libraries in Hydro-Quebec and Alcan and all these different. Uh, Imperial Tobacco hires a lot of libraries. It's a very well-known fact. So, um, so those are the questions that I have in front of me. And I'm doing this research partly because when I read the copyright reform documentation produced by different library organizations, and I was involved personally in writing those, I think their argument could be so much better if they used economics to try to explain why we need exceptions to the Copyright Act, why we're asking to, you know, take away property rights from good, you know, good uh, 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 capitalists. Why are we doing that? And social good, learning, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, sure, great, fine. But why? It's costing people money. Why? Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to skip this part. Uh, I'm trying to figure out also how to explain copyright to my colleagues, right? That's another big part of the issue is raising the awareness of librarians of what copyright is and how it works. And this is my current uh, explanation in one slide or less, right? So essentially you're up on top. If you have to use copyright, you have four options. Either you have a pre-authorization, and these are collecting societies. So if you have a pre-authorization from Copybeck, if you have a Creative Commons license or, or a YouTube license, that's a pre-authorization to use. Or if you already have a license from within your collections, then you can use. Then you have uh, fair, fair dealings or exceptions. And to invoke those, you, you, you're better to have an um, institutional policy that establishes the reasonable limit to the use. That's the CCH decision. Then you have uh, the option to go and ask for permission. It's the blue option, which is the Quebec government option, because they don't recognize Fair, fair dealings and exceptions in the way the Quebec government understands copyright. They always ask for permission. And then you have the question of a reasonable delay. And finally, uh, you could create a new work. Okay, So you want to give an article to your students, but you don't have copyright. You create a summary of it, a resume, an abstract, and you send that with the reference. That's a new work. You modify it. Originality. And so the question uh, of this model, if you have all these options, why fair, fair dealings? Why would you invoke fair dealings? And what I'm noticing right now is we have to figure out, within the context of digital culture, how do we me measure fair dealings? And what are the uh, uh, bibliothek economic, the library tools, the, or, or economic analysis of law tools that we can use to measure when we have, when we have problems with economic markets so that we can have a library intervention? And so where I'm going at with this is usually you want to look at the tension between the private good and the public good, the fact that society gains from everybody reading a cultural work, but then if it's free, how does the creator make or the industry make any kind of money? So non-rival, non-exclusive, that kind of tension that I was talking about. Then you have market failures that you have to think about. 
things like, I, this is my favorite, refusal, silence, and, and greed, right? The three reasons why a right holder may refuse, okay? So you let, given a scenario, you want to use a word, you're asking for permission, and the right holder says, no, you cannot, okay? If you're at the Olympic Games and you're asking Gilles Vigneault to use a clip from his Jean du Pays song, and Gilles Vigneault says, no, that's one thing. Right? But if you're in a school board and you want students to engage in a, in a cultural or, or in, in a uh, current events issue and you want them to read an article in the newspaper and you want to show it on a screen like this, and even better yet, you just want to show the free web version of the article that's available on the newspaper's site on the screen. Right? Do you have to ask for permission for that public performance? Okay, so um, Refusal is no. Silence is when you ask permission and you never get an answer back from the right holder. That happens all the time because they perceive the economic value that they could get from the transaction to be lower than the cost of replying to you. That happens all the time. And uh, greed, when they say, sure, you can use it. Uh, you can use a 15-second clip of The Simpsons for $15,000. Sure, no problem. Do it. Right. So if you're doing a, 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 a thesis on the cultural impact of TV, right, that's a bit problematic if you're not a major corporation. And so I'm not saying there are institutions in society to solve these uh, market failures. For example, collecting societies, limitations to copyright, those exist and they're still necessary in the ongoing world, but we have to track these issues as they emerge. And right now the issue with collecting societies is they may not have the complete bundle of rights you need to operate the, work, the, the, the use that you want on the work. So that's a bit of a problem. We have to figure out how uh, uh, the other mechanisms to use fit into that. And finally, you have to look at negative externalities and social costs. And not a lot of people are researching these issues in terms of the impact libraries can have in these. I mean, there are studies about this in a more global sense, but not from the perspective of librarianship. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm multidisciplinary, intradisciplinary, but I'm doing like law and economics and librarianship and all mixed up and sociology, and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'm just writing a thesis. So the idea here is that libraries have to figure out what we want to do with this stuff, okay? And the way that we, I'm seeing emerge from what university libraries are doing, and by the way, the market for digital works in university libraries in Canada right now is bigger than the, the demand for digital culture. So far, I, 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 I've been able to see that about $300 million is spent from university libraries in, the digi in digital documentation. That's more than books and music combined, so far that I've been able to measure, okay? Um, so the way that library, university libraries do it, so for example, Hein Online, right, or Azimut, or whatever database that you use to do your research, that costs a lot of money, right? <laughs> um, pointing to the lights. Yeah, to, 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 I'm not alone. I'm not the only librarian in the room. That, that's fine. So how do we do it? How does that work? That's what I'm studying in my PhD. I'm taking a bunch of use contracts that we have signed, libraries of signed, and I'm trying to see the clauses that emerge from them so that I can plot one solution that happens on the digital market and how libraries fit into fixing those uh, markets or, or, emerge, uh, or, or participating in those markets. And what happens is we ask for the digital document and the work. See, before the model was you buy the book, so you have to pay for the book, and then you buy a license from Copyback to make photocopies of the book. But that model doesn't work anymore because if you're going to sell me a digital file, give me the rights to use the file in the full context of my institution. Why don't I buy the right to make digital copies to host on e-learning platforms to make it available to maybe other institution on a limited basis? That's the kind of stuff that's happening. It's no longer buying the work on one and then figuring out the copyright or the licensing in another. I want both together. That's the market that's emerging. And that makes sense because that's how you figure out the tension between the public good and the, right, uh, and, uh, the private good and the public good by ha having the limitations to using the work and the work bundled together in a, uh, in a website and a system. And this is from the Krepik Kapibek Interim Agreement from 2013 and 14. Article 5.6 says that it is understood that Kapibek doesn't, I mean, you're allowed to make copies of things, but Kapibek doesn't make them available for you. You still have to buy your own books, right? If you want to make digital copies of stuff, you can, but Kapibek doesn't sell us anything. So we're paying for rights, but not documents. And that's not the emerging paradigm in digital markets for works. And so the idea is, if you're not going to sell us what we want, then we're going to use it for free with fair dealings. It's very simple. That's what 
That's how I claim we can have, or I'm actually trying to figure out if this asser assertion is correct, right? And my hypothesis is not that copyright uh, impacts libraries, but it's rather the other way around. Libraries impact copyright because we have access to fair use, fair dealings, and other exceptions. We are not, you know, strangled by copyright as most of my colleagues would claim, but rather we need to figure out the mechanisms by which we can interact with copyright or we can regulate copyright. That's actually uh, the short version. Libraries regulate copyright is my short hypothesis. And so being a librarian in Canada right now means that we have to express what fair dealing is. What are the exceptions to copyright that we can invoke to strip away the monopoly power from evil rent seekers in cultural markets? Sorry, I'm running out of time, so I'm giving you the punchy version of my speech. And so here are three radical claims about what fair dealing does in digital markets in Canada. The first thing, we don't steal, we invest. When I have staff, in my library scanning a paper document to make it available under fair dealings to a student and we do that when we have a paper journal and a student requests a single copy for their use we have a staff member make a single scan and email it that's the CCH decision in universities we've been doing that for a while I'm not stealing I'm investing in the work if I could take that PDF file and instead of deleting it I could create a repository that with other universities and then we could all pay for the use rights to these documents, that would be a much better market than having to delete it every time that I scan something. That's just unfortunate, right? I see fair dealings as an awesome way for institutions to invest in cultural markets, but it's lost because of the way the law is written and the way that we interpret it. So that's the first radical idea about uh, Fair, fair dealings. The second one is we signal our preferences. If you allow your customers to do crazy things with what you sell them, then you start noticing new ways of making money with what you sell them. So we signal the preferences of what we want to do with the digital market, the digital culture. If you don't let us do that, well, you're going to miss out on uh, growth because you're never going to figure out what is the next big thing. You know, Facebook and Google didn't ask everybody if they could scan their whole internet. It just sent its spiders out and everybody noticed that having a search engine that could sift through the internet was a lot more interesting than getting a little bit of licensing of Google copying the internet. That's how Google does it. So you signal preferences. And the final thing is we optimize prices. I, as a librarian, represent 44,000 students at Concordia University. I'm a, I create a club good. I have their resources or their backing or go, the government funds me because of their backing and I represent the, the demand side of the equation. Looking at it from my perspective means that you, you stop looking at copyright from a supply side issue, looking at the demand side of the equation and figuring out if supply has a monopoly power Maybe there's a situation, a power symmetry, where they can extract risk, uh, uh, rents from the market, and I need to be able to respond to that, which means that prices will go down. But that doesn't mean that it's bad, right? It just means we're optimizing pricing, which all of which leads to innovation. And that's the problem right now, is we're stuck in situations where we're waiting for the industry to supply things that we need. They're not because they're afraid. University libraries have been able to muddle through because people who write what libraries buy are faculty and we've been able to coordinate with the, the creators in creating a digital market. But that's going to be a lot harder when you start looking at uh, just public, public uh, publishers, right? So that's one of the things that we're trying to, to do. And these are my radical claims about what fair dealings are all about, that nothing, something that you never hear about in the, in the world. So... That's what I got to say about that. It's a little bit much, right, for a lunch, <clears throat> lunch break? I should have more pictures of my kids, I know. But I'm not going to do that. So what I'm, what I'm trying to, maybe what, what I could do is engage you guys in a conversation about how you consume digital culture. Anybody here has bought an ebook? Okay. <laughs> uh, just a question yeah. before yeah, yeah, our yeah, last yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we talk about our personal yeah. uh, lives. Um, the third point, yeah. um, so your, your take is that you this would enhance the efficiency of the price discovery mechanism yes. 
through fair dealing. Now, the, the piece that I'm, I'm not sure about is to how do you aggregate preferences in a meaningful way to the extent that your clients or the demand mm -hmm. Uh, they don't pay for the product that you're be, you're going to yep, be absolutely. giving them. So that's the piece I'm missing. How, that's that's and, and, yeah. And, to, to, and then you jump on the on the market. The question is why is zero better than one dollar? I mean, why isn't zero better than one dollar? Essentially, why why wouldn't free be better than whatever you could pay for it? Is, am I I'm no, kind no, of flipping no. the question around? No. The question is. No. My understanding yeah. of how the price mechanism works is that you want people to reveal their, their preferences, uh, and they make choices, mm -hmm. and, they're, and, they're, and then there's their willingness to pay for this or for that. So if, as, as a student or as a member mm -hmm. of the university community, I go to the library and I take this or that book or file, I'm not paying for this. So there's no willingness to pay. Uh, I'm just taking that. I have a free library card. I could. Uh, you know, yep. take a lot of books and it's free. Right. Well, notionally. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No free no, I agree, I agree. Notionally. Yeah. But the, the price is hidden. It's, yeah. And if it's hidden, I, I cannot, as a, as a member of the university community, reveal my preferences and my willingness to, to pay for this or that. Mm -hmm. And so I could go in the library and rent all sorts of books that I'm not going to be reading because it's, it's free, notionally. So, how does the library? coming as an intermediary between me mm -hmm. and publishers or producers of content uh, act as the uh, optimizer of prices. Absolutely. That's, a, that's, so that's a, my question. That's a great question. So what the, there are different ways, I, and I'll give you an example of one thing that's happening right now at Concordia. But usually that means being involved, and anybody who has a, an idea about this and wants to engage, please feel free. I think we are a small enough group that we could talk, and we could talk in French and English, and I'll translate back and forth. That's fine. One of the ways that we do this is that we offer uh, services to our community to try to figure out what they want. Okay, So we call these document delivery services. So I talk to faculty, and so you want to organize a, a, your classroom and how your class interacts with documentation. And you tell me what you want them to read. Okay, you tell me, okay, I want to have some TED Talks and some YouTube videos and some articles and some books. And I have options for you. Okay, we could do a uh, réserve des professeurs. We could scan things and host them online. We can stream things. We've actually, I don't know if this is the case so much at Université de Montréal, but we've been experimenting a lot with different kinds of technologies like a, like a streaming server, like scanning things and hosting them under a password-protected website to try to see under fair dealings how far we can go and what we could do for our community. The idea is that we're not sure if that's what faculty will want. It's something that we can do with the technology we have at hand, but we're testing different delivery mechanisms and different models that are not being supplied to or are being supplied to us by some suppliers, but not all of them. So we're trying to provide for uh, a service where we can interact with our user base and we can ask them what, what it is they want in these contracts and how it works. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, or it's not, but, doesn't satisfy but, you? But, 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 <laughs> I don't want to take, take the, the floor for too long, but my, my only concern, I'm just going yeah, in yeah. the same dire direction, uh, is to the extent that there's no cost incurred yeah. by yeah. your users, well, you can have some form of rent seeking, whereas you have a group of well-organized people in the university community who will uh, monopolize absolutely the, 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 yep. the resource it's free and you, uh, mm -hmm. you will walk down the library aisles and you'll see collections of work no one wants except two or three people on the campus but they've been very vocal and very active so that's my my only yep. concern yeah, yeah. with this absence not absence but this opacity with respect to price yeah and your model um, maybe I could say this uh, they don't feel the constraint but we do when we're filling an interlibrary loan request, I know exactly how many staff minutes it takes me, and I know the the category of staff I need within the collective agreement of their union, and I know exactly the average hour, hourly salary. And we in, implement certain constraints on the system, certain limitations that, that are, are signals to the community to back off, essentially. For example, interlibrary loan requests are free now, but they used to be five four dollars a piece. We've been able to optimize the way that libraries share their collections amongst themselves in Quebec to really drive down the cost of how we operate that, so we were able to really open it up. And usually what happens is a PhD student comes in with a list of 50 things they want, 
and we process that now, right? Uh, that wasn't the case so long ago. I also know how long it takes to scan something for to use under fair dealing. To so I could see if if there's a. We also have a a certain sunk cost in our in our staff and and space that we have to allocate somehow. That so that uh, so the idea is that. Um, with this cost, we're kind of like playing poker with our users and we're playing poker with, uh, with the suppliers because I know how much it costs me and I know I can never be cheaper than the right holder. The right holder that has a digital copy of a file, they could charge zero plus the marginal cost to create the file. That's the amount of money it costs for me to access an nth copy of a digital book in theory, right? Assuming that fixed costs are too low. So, I can never beat that because my fixed cost will always be higher than the supplier because they have scale. I will never have the kind of scale they want. So I could say that having fair dealing as a process to test different radical ideas about what markets could be will never impede on the rice holders market. It's not direct to your question, but it's part of the general context of I don't understand why people are uh, the industry in Quebec is so afraid of fair dealings because of these three reasons. Uh, the idea that let us play a little bit, we'll we'll figure it out with the innovators, because usually right now, I mean, with all the digital services that we offer to the community, it's only a slight. I mean, we're if you look at Roger Everett's adoption cycle, which goes from innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards, right? And that's eighty five percent of of users usually, or to one hundred percent. We're still within the ten, fifteen, twenty percent of innovators. And the fact, the question I I asked about ebooks it goes exactly in that direction. I would expect everybody here to raise your hand and say, "Yeah, I bought an ebook, or I downloaded one from a library, or I, f I found a free one on the internet legally, of course." because there are free books out there. Uh, but it's not the case. We're still facing a, a market where we have innovators that are trying to express their needs to the market. And that's an expensive, market research is extremely expensive from the perspective of the right. And we're doing that for free. When I pick up the phone and I say, you know, can you get me a right to include this file in an e-learning environment? Some publishers say, really? Libraries want to pay for that? Well, yeah. Of course, they know that if they sell me the right up front, they won't sell transactional copies to each individual student. And that's how they extract the most rent from the market, is by selling a six-month use contract to a textbook at $100, as opposed to selling a digital copy of the textbook to the library, which could be, how much is that worth, right? But see, those questions are, we're, we're in the thick of it right now, and we're still looking at the early, the innovators and early adopters of the of these digital culture music not so much music is a whole if I ask people how many people here have digital music on their devices everybody's like ah oh, sure legally right uh, but you understand what I'm going with with all of this the question is if if we're the evil th thieves we're not gonna go anywhere Li and I want libraries to survive because society needs a, an institution that provides free hidden cost access to knowledge culture and, and learning it's just, it's just, in my mind, it, it, it's the, it's the, libraries have been around for 5,000 years, and I think they'll be around for another 5,000. Not so much collecting societies and publishers. Question. How are you going to measure the uh, positive externalities of the library? I wish I knew. See, I think that's going to be the question that's going to get me tenured in a, in a, either a law faculty or a library sciences. You know, I, right now what I'm doing for my PhD, I, 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 that's you, you, that is exactly where the money is. That question is, is what I got to figure out. But I couldn't do that in my PhD because I would never finish it. I want, I need something that was executable and, and, and I could finish, right? So that's going to be step two. Okay, but it's probably, uh, probably impossible until you do the, uh, the, uh, the work in, on Earth. So you have to, an empiric. Uh, and and and, and, maybe, yeah. and, and, and even if it, uh, I don't know if it's possible to do that uh, in large scale. Exactly, there are too many variables, right? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking of things like, and just to try to figure. I mean, I, I have ideas about how to do this. So, if you can get decent statistics from, let's say, the OECD or some other uh, Lucidia, you know, or, or or National Statistics Agency from a few countries of of spending on libraries. So StatsCan produces that for Canada, but. Or just national libraries use a proxy, right, to measure or how many universities there are. 
And then you look at growth and economic development, and you try to pair those two statistics. That would be kind of some kind of macro analysis. I mean, but then again, who knows? If you're looking at, you know, if they discover, uh, you know, petroleum in Norway and they spend a lot of money in their libraries and they're innovative. I mean, but there's there's probably a way to look at some macro statistics and try to see correlations to to, to pair that in a certain way. Um, but that that I, the answer is I don't know. I wish I knew. And I think a lot of people are wondering that right now. Because you could optimize that, that figure. Maybe last, uh, last uh, one, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just a, it's not a question, maybe you can, uh, but just a reflection about that. The, the question that I thought it is, uh, I think it is, how much we have to, to protect people, the creator, mm. uh, for, uh, to incite these people to invest and create that's mm -hmm. good and 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 after uh, the other question is is how the law can regulate that efficiently or right and and, and yeah it's maybe the the the, the, the only but the, the big question in the in the in the copyright law it's uh, how much we have to protect them because one the, once you have the paper in the library, it's become a public good, and after, uh, you cannot be paid by other. But it give, uh, and, and I think yeah, that yeah, it no, gives to, uh, uh, fair uh, question, uh, fair good question. <laughs> uh, to the people because if you, the people that use this information, yeah. can create other things. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So See, yeah. It, at, at the end, exactly. we have to balance that to, to create more innovation. Exactly. So, so let me put it this way. I'll use an analogy of another public good, water. Okay. If there's too much copyright, water freezes, and there's no fluidity in the market. Okay. So that's when you have big corporations who need to invest massive amounts of capital to do anything, to make you know movies that are going into you know I'm uh, what's it called the Avatar type. You know, Titanic type. That's that's frozen culture. It's too 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 much capital that freezes. Too much copyright. But then, if you don't have enough copyright, there's too much entropy. There's too much chaos. It becomes something like the Norwegian video cassette market. So um, uh, Nigeria, right, has a insanely bubbly market for uh, for video cassette short movies. And the average lifespan of these movies is two weeks. Because after two weeks, people make copies of these videos, and they, they go, and they're done. And there's no more market that you could. And so there, if, you, if you, I read The Economist, amongst other, many other publications, and they, they actually cover this once in a while. And they talk about the Norwegian market for, uh, the Nigerian market for videos, video cassettes. And that's an example that is, that is there's too much chaos. There's, there's so little protection that there's no market possible. And so it evaporates. Right. So what you want is, you know, something a copyright law that's just warm enough but not cool enough that it's liquid and it's fluid and there's use and it flows and it doesn't, you know. So the question is also interesting for that. With regards to the user, I'm a personal fan of the of of the user as creator model where before you had a very clear distinction between the professional écrivain membre de l'UNEC and all the other people in society. I don't like that model anymore because if you look at, okay, so a, a Facebook feed may not be worth anything and it may not be interesting and it may be not, but it's still writing, right? And I could, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we will, uh, we will entertain more porous relationships between creators and, and consumers of culture. And I actually believe that the future of culture is to have a, so maybe everybody will write a book one day and maybe instead of having parental leave, we'll have book leave society and we can ask you know for a year off to write a book and then you get 55 percent pay for nine months and then you write your no and then it flops or it, and then you give it away or you try to I, it doesn't matter you understand what i'm saying right i think that it's an it's 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 not it's what it was and if you look at how copyright evolved over the, the centuries first it was a law to regulate the relationship between publishers that's what the copyright was and then la société des, uh, des gens de lettres and Naïla I and Beaumarchais and uh, Victor Hugo and Dickens got, got involved in the 19th century and said, wait a minute, it's not about how publishers deal with each other, it's also about authors. And the droit d'auteur came out. That's the second. That's the tango à deux. 
But then the tango à trois is the user, is the consumer, the person that says, hell no, I won't buy an encrypted MP3 file because that's worth squat to me. And if you're not going to sell me files that I can put on my various devices, I'm not going to buy anything, right? That's the tango à trois. So I think if you really want to understand copyright in my pluralist uh, postmodern way, it's not just about authors anymore. If it's just about them, that's going to kill the market. That's going to kill culture, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, sorry. Okay, we're about uh, <laughs> over time now, and it was very interesting. So rather than talk about Cinderella, we should be talking about Goldilocks <laughs> yeah. when we think about a copyright regime, if I understand the, you exactly. correctly. Just right. Uh, just right. Alors, merci beaucoup pour cette présentation, Olivier, cette dernière de la, de, de, du trimestre. Je pense que ça a été très intéressant. Puis euh, nous, nous allons nous revoir euh, l'année prochaine, euh, l'année académique prochaine, avec d'autres présentations, je pense. Euh, C'est intéressant, et j'espère de certaines personnes. Merci encore à Olivier. Merci. Merci beaucoup.